So when you talk about the pathogenesis of amyloidosis, it all starts with a protein that misfolds. The misfolded proteins stick together to form fibrils. They infiltrate the heart, the kidneys, and various other organs. And when the heart is affected, the symptom is heart failure, obviously. So what is the current algorithm based on all that I've discussed so far? The current algorithm is to suspect amyloidosis based on heart failure or other red flag symptoms such as musculoskeletal manifestations, lumbar spinal stenosis, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, biceps tendon rupture, neuropathy with heart failure, aortic stenosis, thick ventricles, older adults. If you have any of those and you suspect amyloid, the first step would be to evaluate for a plasma cell dyscrasia. This is extremely important because light chain amyloidosis without therapy has a median survival of less than 12 months, maybe even six months. So any delays in therapy could be fatal for some of these patients. So the first step would be let's look for a plasma cell dyscrasia. If that testing is abnormal, then immediately refer the patient to a hematologist with amyloid expertise. They can follow up with biopsy, either involved organ or endomyocardial biopsy, cardiac biomarkers, cardiac MRI may be considered at that point, and either amyloidosis is excluded or light chain amyloidosis is diagnosed and therapy is initiated quickly. If the light chain evaluation is normal, then these patients are candidates for bone avitracer scintigraphy. And if that is performed and the patients show a positive scan, then the diagnosis of transthyretin amyloidosis is established. You send off a genetic test. If that's negative, you conclude it's wild type. If it's positive, then you know it's variant transthyretin cardiomyopathy. If the scan is negative, grade zero, amyloidosis is excluded. You have no AL amyloidosis, you're grade zero, so transthyretin amyloid is excluded. If you have grade one uptake, something like this, and we have a spec CT image, as in this case, showing that this is myocardial activity and not blood pool activity, what do you do with that patient? You cannot ignore that. So this is a patient where we would perform further imaging with cardiac MRI, for example, and follow up with biopsy as needed, because this is something you don't want to miss. Therapy of patients with transthyretin amyloidosis at an early stage is superior in terms of outcomes compared to therapy of patients with advanced disease. So if this is an early disease that you have captured, these patients are likely to benefit from treatment. So once you do this, MRI plus minus biopsy, you conclude it's early transthyretin cardiomyopathy, or you may learn that this is a rare amyloid cardiomyopathy. So the last step that I um, need to cover is some of these grade zero patients, you may have a high clinical suspicion, particularly if your MRI is classic or if the patient has a typical uh, TTR gene mutation or it's a child of a parent with transthyretin amyloid and your scan's negative. So in those patients, I would recommend further evaluation with cardiac MRI. If your test is negative for bone scintigraphy, go ahead with cardiac MRI and or biopsy and then follow down the path. So the last case I wanted to share with you is a 69-year-old man with a witnessed cardiac arrest with a rare cardiac amyloidosis. So this patient was from outside of the country, came to the Brigham for a second opinion, and these are his MRI images. And you can see that on the TI scout and the inversion time recovery scout, you can see that the myocardium nulls first and then the blood pool nulls. And this is a classic finding in uh, cardiac amyloidosis. Late gadolinium enhancement, you can see this patchy mid-myocardial enhancement, but really don't see too much of a transmural uptake. So this patient came to the Brigham. Uh, he actually underwent biopsy at his uh, hospital and that was diagnosed as APOA4 cardiac amyloidosis by mass spectrometry. He came to see us with this diagnosis for further treatment, and he was enrolled in our clinical trial. And here you can see the PET scan showing beautiful images with amyloid in both the left and right ventricles. So these PET tracers image not only the heart, but they can image the lungs, they can image the 
whole body, so other organs as well. So that's a huge advantage for a systemic disease such as amyloidosis, which affects not just the heart, but it can affect your liver, kidneys, spleen, and various other lungs and other organs. So here's uh, F18 fluorvitapir. This is an example of a patient with cardiac and pulmonary uptake. And here's at the bottom a control study showing no significant myocardial uptake. This trace is excreted through the hepatobiliary system, so the liver activity is uh, physiologic. What about the other tracer? Again, multiple different patients. This traces can image not just AL, but APOA4, as you saw. This is a case of a transthyretine cardiac amyloid patient showing liver uptake. This tracer does not have physiological liver uptake, and this is pathological. So again, we are giving new insights into this disease, and we always thought that transthyretine amyloid predominantly affects the heart and the musculoskeletal and nervous system. There are autopsy data suggesting that transthyretine can deposit in the liver and in the kidneys. So this is something that I started the talk with, talking about how we diagnose or suspect amyloid based on clinical red flags, use structural imaging to see if there's any changes, then further study with molecular imaging to identify infiltration, and then treat the patients. Right now, I think with all the radio tracers that we have access to, we are able to ask questions on how does the heart remodel with amyloidosis? What causes cardiac or organ tropism? Why is it that some people have the heart affected, others have the kidney or the lungs affected, and could we learn something from there? And then, of course, if we can understand what triggers protein misfolding in some of these patients, we can probably consider primordial prevention in these patients.